I'm going to talk today about the six trillion dollar energy industry, the largest industry on planet Earth, and how it's rapidly being disrupted. Disruption is a very big word. Does it happen to something as physical and non-digital as this? Well, we see it happening already. Some of you know this company, Peabody Coal, the largest privately held coal company on planet Earth. It was. It was working at epic scale, billions in revenue, and now Peabody Coal is in bankruptcy. And in fact, over the period from 2013 to 2015, the four largest coal companies in the U.S. all went bankrupt. Now, a lot of that happened because of the development of cheap natural gas in the U.S. But as you'll see, the new disruption is faster than that, and it's global. In fact, in Texas now, coal is being pushed off the grid not by natural gas, but by cheap wind power. Wind power was once a footnote in the global energy mix, but over the last decade, it's grown by more than 600%, 6.5 times growth, and it's now about 6% of U.S. electricity generation. Now, a fair bit of that was driven by policy, but that policy would not have had anywhere near this impact if it were not for the exponential pace of innovation in wind power. Wholesale electricity in the U.S. costs about six cents a kilowatt hour. And at the beginning of the wind power rise in 1980 or so, wind power cost 55 cents a kilowatt hour. There was no reason that for a fungible resource like energy, you would turn to wind. But that cost has plummeted. And now, last year, the average price of a new long-term wind power contract in the interior of the U.S. was less than two cents, 1.8 cents a kilowatt hour. That's a subsidized price, but if you back out all the subsidies, it would still be about a four cent per kilowatt hour price, now undercutting the price of coal, natural gas, nuclear, and everything else. Some of that, or the largest fraction of that, is because we've gotten better at engineering these giant machines. When you build a wind turbine that's taller, it accesses winds that blow faster and blow more consistently. It also, by doubling the length of the blade, you sweep it through four times the area. So for double the material cost, you get four times the energy output. So as our engineering technologies and our material science improves, wind power will keep getting cheaper. Not only is it getting cheaper, it's becoming a more steady source of power. It's always been intermittent. The wind blows sometimes, then it stops other times. But capacity factor, the measure of how steadily wind turbines produce power, has soared, nearly doubling over the last 20 years. And now, in the best sites in the U.S., it's at 60 percent, actually rivaling the coal fleet in the U.S. So wind power will keep getting cheaper. But what's happening even faster than that is the incredible disruption brought on by solar power. Solar power is behaving as much like a digital technology as a physical technology. The sun hits our planet with 10,000 times more energy and sunlight than we use from all sources combined. But decades ago, it was completely impractical to deploy enough solar panel material to capture that energy at anything like an economical price. But that has changed rapidly. Just as the cost of silicon cells that we use for making microchips has plunged, the cost of solar power has also plunged. In fact, if you take one watt of solar material, it cost $77 for one watt of solar material in the late 1970s. Now it's down to 30 cents, a 250 times price decline. Again, nothing like any physical industry that exists, more like a digital transformation than anything else. And so now we're reaching crossover. We're reaching the point where in the sunny parts of the world, solar is simply the cheapest energy you can buy. Now, as we scale solar, we see this very clear exponential. Every time you double the production of solar power, you reduce the price by about 25%. This is known as Swanson's Law. And so that means there's a virtuous cycle, that as solar scales, it goes through this phenomenon. Every increase in the size of the industry brings down the price. As the price goes down, it's able to tap into new markets, which further increase demand and increase the scale of the industry, which further lowers the price. And this is now 
effectively unstoppable. Regardless of policy choices the world makes, it's now a question not of if, but of when. Because fossil fuel costs go up and down, but the cost of technology only goes in one direction, down. So I told you crossover is happening. What does crossover look like? So a new natural gas plant in the U.S. will cost between five and six cents a kilowatt hour, and that's incredibly cheap. Worldwide, it's nearly double this. Right? What do new solar plants look like? Well, China, Trina Solar, the number one builder of solar, building this plant in the Gobi Desert at about six cents a kilowatt hour, and likely to bring that down on their next plant. In the U.S. in 2015, the cheapest price of a new solar plant was just under six cents from First Solar. In 2016, that dropped to 4.2 cents. In late 2016, First Solar made a deal with a Berkshire Hathaway utility, Warren Buffett's company, at 3.9 cents. And then earlier this year, the city of Palo Alto signed a solar power deal at 3.6 cents a kilowatt hour. Again, that's competing at five or six cents for natural gas. Now, this is a subsidized price, let me be clear. But back out all the subsidies that exist, and this is still about five cents a kilowatt hour. And it's still going down. This is the price of solar power long-term contracts in the US over the last eight years. An 80% price reduction in that time, and no end in sight for this price decline. And now it's global. In the U.S., we have cheap natural gas. That's not true anywhere else. In India, at the beginning of this year, in February, a record-breaking price was set. That record was smashed in May, last month, about two weeks ago, actually. This bid, two bids came in and tied for this new power plant, actually. 2.4 rupees, or 3.8 cents, a kilowatt hour, 20% cheaper than coal in India. This is the country, by the way, people in the coal business were betting on as a future rise in coal consumption that would bring the cost of that commodity back up. But the price of solar in India has plunged by 75%, by a factor of four in those last four years. Now underneath the price of coal there comfortably. In Mexico, power auction recently, average price a little over five cents, already cheaper than gas. Low price, an Italian company, NL, came in at three and a half cents with no subsidies. About half the price of a new natural gas plant there. In Chile, close to the equator, average price of a new solar uh, bid and a power contract, also at five cents. But the low price came in at 2.9 cents. In fact, we've had a dozen cases in Chile where solar power has just swept power auctions with no subsidies, beating out all other technologies. But even that's not the lowest price anymore. That was the lowest price in the world for about one month until this happens. One of my favorite pictures of these guys here with their solar plants. In Dubai, we had a bid, a power auction for a new tranche of solar for a gigantic solar power plant, 1.3 gigawatts, and the low price, the winner of this auction, came in at a stunning 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour. This is not just the cheapest price we've ever seen for solar, and again, this is completely unsubsidized. This is the cheapest price we've ever seen for a long-term electricity contract on planet Earth, anywhere with any technology. And it wasn't just one rogue bidder being exceptionally, exceptionally aggressive. There were four bids that all came in under the previous year's uh, lowest price ever of three cents. Four bidders came in at half the price of natural gas or less. And so I told you wind power grew by a factor of six and a half over the last decade. Solar has grown by a factor of 50 over the last decade, and it continues to grow. Put an exponential growth curve on a log scale, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, it looks like a straight line. Solar's growth has been exponential. It will slow, perhaps it's starting to slow right now, but this year, growth, 35 to 40%. It's doubling every two, two and a half years on planet Earth. Of course, this is regional. It's not windy everywhere, it's not sunny everywhere. I live in Seattle, not the best place for solar. So in the US, most of the solar being built is being built in the west and the southwest. In Europe, it's a bit different. 
in Europe, the solar revolution really started with Germany. And in Germany, it makes very little physical sense to deploy solar. But the German people decided that's what they wanted to do. And that brought down the price by scaling the industry for everyone. But in the south of Europe, we're headed for prices very similar to what we see in California or Texas. And worldwide, the implications are even bigger. Because 1.3 billion people alive today live in energy poverty without electricity. Where do they live? Almost entirely in Africa and in South Asia. And those people in the poorest places on Earth are going to have the cheapest energy anywhere on the planet. And that's going to upend where we decide to manufacture. It's going to upend where we see growth. More relevant for financial markets, where is the growth in energy consumption coming over the next 20 years? Three quarters of it is coming in that rectangle, all of which is substantially sunnier than Europe, where the solar revolution really began. That's a disruption that's on its way. And so we see it now. In China, earlier this year, China had 104 coal power plants that were on the drawing boards suspended. It's about $80 billion of investment taken off the table. Because these things have a lifetime of 30 or 40 years to recoup their initial capital cost. And the Chinese look ahead and say, that's not going to be viable. You can see the map of these all around. 40 of these plants had already started construction. At least $20 billion US had been spent already on these projects that got canceled. It's not just China. Just last month, in one month, India canceled 14 gigawatts of solar, a cost of about $9 billion wiped off the table. And the reason given was that the price of solar was in free fall in India. This is being disrupted. And it's not just that solar is now cheaper than building a new coal power plant. In India, one third of the coal power fleet has an operating cost per kilowatt hour that is more expensive than that record low solar price. Those plants with a combined value of 30 or $40 billion are going to be underwater very soon as their OPEX can't keep up with the cost of solar. And so we see around the world the coal pipeline is just plunging. Over one year, the number of uh, plants in operation or in uh, the process of being constructed dropped by a factor of three as more and more were put on hold out of which they will never return. And so why did Peabody Coal go bankrupt? Well, natural gas was part of it, but the other part was this. Peabody had those dashed lines. This is a projection for what they expected for Chinese coal imp imports. And what actually happened was the white line. Coal is still the number one energy source on planet Earth, but the coal market has peaked, and now coal demand globally is dropping. And so suddenly the price of that commodity is plunging. Now, of course, with solar and wind, today they're about 7% of world electricity, not that much. They can reach about 70% without energy storage. But with energy storage, they can go further. We all know who this guy is? Tony Stark? I don't want to give away Elon's secret identity. He's the closest thing we've got, okay? Tony, Elon, is introducing the Tesla Powerwall, and he's able to do that because Lithium-ion batteries are also an exponential technology. They've dropped in cost by a factor of four over the last four or five years. And they drop in cost, they're the blue line here, they drop in cost at almost the exact same pace as solar, a reduction of 20% or so per doubling. And beyond lithium-ion that we have today, there's a dozen additional energy storage technologies in the pipe. Uh, this is the inventor of the lithium-ion battery, a guy named John Goodenough, great name. He's proposing, in his lab, he's built sodium-based solid-state batteries that can hold three times as much energy as lithium-ion. Or around the world, a dozen labs are working on lithium-air batteries that can hold 10 times the amount of energy as lithium-ion. And then we can have drones that loiter for six hours, our little toy quadcopters, robots that operate for hours without being plugged in, and cars that go about as far as we want them to go. Or the other direction. For the grid, we have but batteries that are big and bulky, don't hold as much energy per unit of weight, but can go for 10 times the number of cycles of lithium-ion, bringing down the total levelized cost of these. So you put all of this together, you put these trends together, and you reach a crazy conclusion. We've always assumed that clean energy would be expensive energy. We should do it for moral reasons, for climate change, for pollution. 
but the cost of fuel fluctuates. The cost of technology only goes down. And that leads you to the conclusion that clean energy will ultimately be the cheapest energy we have. Even uh, very conservative organizations are starting to say that. This is the IEA, the International Energy Agency, the world's experts on energy. The IEA is not what you would call an exponential organization. I will demonstrate that they've heard me say that. Someday someone will throw a tomato at me when I'm talking to an IEA group. Hasn't happened yet. But here's why I say it. Here's the IEA's forecasts year over year for what would happen with the growth of solar energy. See at the bottom they have the 2002 forecast in light blue. Then that got beaten. So in 2004 they lifted the forecast. Great. Smart. 2006, oh, we're still a little behind, lift the forecast, excellent. 2008, we're still a little below what's actually happening in the market, lift the forecast. I think they're going to the same Excel macro and hitting control C, control V, or something a lot like that is what's happening. What they are actually forecasting is linear growth. This is their projection for the total amount of solar installed around the world. And you see it's a straight line. They're projecting that the world will install the same amount of solar every year from now to 2040 as they did in 2014. But that's not what's happening. This is an exponential process, not a linear one. But even this organization that has been wrong on every single solar forecast ever made in its lifetime now says solar will be the cheapest energy by mid-century. It will be the largest source of electricity by mid-century. By mid-century. Four cents a kilowatt hour, they say, unbeatable on rooftops. I think they're right, but it's a bit slow on when they see that actually happening. UBS now says renewables are deflationary to energy prices. I thought I'd only ever hear myself say something that crazy. Or my favorite of these charts is Alliance Bernstein, private equity. Alliance Bernstein put out this report, this graph, a couple of years ago. Across the bottom, there's the price of coal, gas, and oil. And if we took it out to 2015, it would drop down a bit again. But that's mostly irrelevant. Now, across the, the right, you see a gray line. I think someone's kid took a crayon and scrawled across their report at home, right? Now, that's the price of solar coming down over the long run. And here's the price of wind coming down over the long run. And here's the price of batteries coming down over the long run. Technology is disruptive to traditional energy. And at those prices, even the world's natural gas fleet running on shale, cracked, fracked gas cannot compete with these new prices. These will become stranded assets, as much as the coal fleet is. Things where we've put the capex in, but we can't operate them for the lifetime needed to recoup the investment because they're undercut economically by a competitor. It's a little bit like the disruption we've seen in other markets. A bit slower, but still happening. Now, all of that is electricity. And 60% of the world's energy use is electrical, but there is this other big thing we do. Right? We drive around, and for that, we use oil. Oil will be disrupted, too. I'll give you the words of Sheikh Yamani, who was the uh, oil minister for Saudi Arabia during the oil crisis of the 70s. Right. The world didn't abandon stone because we ran out of stone. We invented bronze tools that were better. And he's warning his fellow princes here that the world will invent something better than oil. And in fact, that disruption is happening. And it's important because oil itself is sometimes a $3 trillion a year commodity, but it's one that's incredibly volatile. In just the last decade, we've seen this price swing from $150 a barrel to $35 a barrel, up and down. And that is driven by a difference of about 2 million barrels a day between supply and demand in a 100 barrel a day, a 90 million barrel a day market. About a 2% swing in supply demand can swing prices by a factor of three or more. It's an incredibly tight market, incredibly volatile. And that means, by the way, that no one can predict the short-term price of oil. You look at the world's best oil forecasters, those are their consensus forecasts going off to the right as the price of oil was in free fall in that period in 2014 and 2015. Because everyone has status quo bias. The world will go back to being like it's been. So no one can predict the short-term price of oil, and I'm not even going to try. But I will tell you what the long-term price of oil is. And the long-term price of oil is cheap, 
because like coal, it will be a commodity where demand is shrinking and you don't want to be selling into that market. And there's three interconnected changes in transportation that are driving that. Automation of vehicles. When you've gotten a chance to ride in what Google self-driving car? One person, excellent. Two million kilometers driven, 16 accidents, 15 of them caused by humans. Let me show you viscerally what it's like to take a ride in a self-driving car. The Hans team will never believe this. Oh my goodness. Go is the right word. Holy shit. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Oh my god. What? It's driving itself. Ah! Ah! Those. Those should be the screams of the oil futures market, actually. Because self-driving cars, they really they drive very politely. They always obey the law, unless the developer like, tunes it up a little bit for you. Self-driving cars don't just transform how we transport ourselves, don't just give us back that leisure time. They cut fuel use massively. Three fleets of self-driving trucks crisscrossed Europe last summer, and they saved fuel by about 30% because they were convoying and dragging, right? Software is eating oil consumption. That's trend one, is automation, self-driving. Trend two is rides as a service, and the reason it matters is because when you hail a ride this way, you see the economic pressure of the cost per mile directly. And so a new technology that lowers the cost per mile is just going to win. You're not going to call an Uber and get the more expensive version than the cheaper version, right, if it's equivalent in production. And the third is electrification. And these things interrelate. Electric vehicles are tiny. They're a footnote. They're about 0.2% of all cars in the market. They're smaller than a pixel on a graph of oil consumption. But they're growing at 73% per year. That's what wins in the long term. And they have some fundamental advantages. This is the entire drivetrain and engine of an electric vehicle, as compared to this, for an internal combustion vehicle. And so the energy cost per mile in an EV is about one quarter of what it is in your fuel, fossil fuel car. And the maintenance cost is about one fifth. So the cost per mile driven in an EV is already at parity with the cost per mile of a fossil fuel car, and it's dropping, dropping fast. And so there's this virtuous cycle. If you get into an EV, the, the number one blocker of people buying electric vehicles today is range anxiety. But if you get into an Uber, when's the last time you wondered how much gas was in the tank? Never. I do professionally now, I ask, but who cares, really? Or if your car can self-drive and it can go charge itself, you won't care about that. And if you're paying per mile, you're going to pick the thing that's cheapest per mile, and that will be electric. Right? And we've seen this rapid transformation. Our gut impressions of electric vehicles a decade ago where they were slow, they were clunky, they were no fun, they couldn't accelerate, they were boxy, they were boring. Now they're spaceships, right? This $80,000 vehicle is A, the best driving experience there is, B, it's faster than a half a million dollar Lamborghini. We've totally upended what we think because of the exponential pace of improvement of batteries more than anything else. And because of that, the price keeps coming down. Tesla starts shipping these next month, $35,000. That's the same as the average price of a new car in the US. But it accelerates like a Porsche, and it has self-driving features built in. Who can compete with that? And it's not just Tesla. Every other auto manufacturer knows they have to get in on this game. So we have half a dozen vehicles coming at $30,000 or less with a 200-mile range or less. And if you uh, look at, again, the traditional forecasters, the EIA, the US version of the IEA, said by 2040, we'd have 20,000 electric vehicles with a 200-mile range on US roads. Tesla took pre-orders for half a million, you know, $1,000 each, $500 million of free capital for Tesla. So one manufacturer is going to blow past this forecast by orders of magnitude. 
And again, this virtuous cycle. The most expensive component is the battery. As we sell more EVs, we sell more batteries. As we sell more batteries, what happens with our cost? Goes down. As the vehicle gets cheaper, we sell more of them. So again, this virtuous cycle starts playing. And the craziest thing I'll say is that it's not just the per mile cost, the upfront cost will be dramatically cheaper for an electric vehicle because they are so much simpler. They're expensive now only because they're made at low scale. When they're made at anything like full scale of normal vehicles, they will be incredibly cheap. Average cost of a car in the US, 33 grand. The cheapest new car you can buy in the US is a two-seater smart car at $14,000. And at current pace, a car like the Tesla Model 3 will be cheaper than that to buy outright 2027 or so, 10 years. So then who's going to buy the fossil fuel vehicle? So this is a major disruption that's happening. And the world sees it. Beijing decided two months ago they were going to take all 67,000 taxis in the city and make them electric. India, not to be outdone, said, well, you know what? By 2030, the only new cars we're going to allow to be sold in India will be electric. Well, even without this, market forces at current pace will make it about 80% in 2030. Right? And at that pace, how long before they take 2 million barrels a day of demand away? Ah, six, seven years. And that's the same thing that led to the price of oil crashing to 35. And then a few years after that, they're taking away 4 million barrels a day of demand, then 8 million. So that's why the price of oil in the long term, I think, will be permanently cheap. And it's not just me saying that. Shell said recently, oil demand will peak by 2030 and maybe as soon as 2025. Total, the French supergiant, I spent some time with their CEO, talked to him. Their chief economist said just last week, 2025 to 2030, peak oil demand. So what's going to happen to this country that gets 96% of its capital from selling oil? What's going to happen even to this country? 72% of Russia's exports are oil. Well, we see a little bit of the worst case of that in Venezuela today. And you can go look at these slides later and see the incredible dependence of different economies of the world on oil. Even Canada, a quarter of its exports are oil. What happens there? So how do we take action when something is changing so rapidly? Well, the Chinese say crisis is a combination of danger and also opportunity. Two words I haven't even said today, climate change. The world is heating up, three record hot years in a row, and if you do the climate math, we can only burn about a quarter of the world's fossil fuel reserves, leaving $22 trillion of unburnable assets. Is that a bubble ready to pop? like a real estate bubble. City thinks so. In fact, City thinks that's too conservative. City thinks that through now and 2050, there's more than $100 trillion of stranded assets as the world goes clean, policy or no policy. So how do we take action? I'm an investor. I invest in early stage energy startups. You're welcome to join me on AngelList if you'd like. And I come to this with a perspective of finding a gap. Finding a place where there's value to be realized, but it's not being realized by businesses or consumers today. And perhaps the seminal example of that is how rooftop solar took off in the US. It's a combination of technology progress, policy progress, and business model closing that gap. The tech has gotten cheaper. You've heard about that. The US instituted policies like net metering that you sell excess electricity back to the grid. But it was really a business model innovation that broke open that market. It was Elon Musk and his cousin Lyndon saying, there's a gap. People would make money in the long term or save money in the long term by going solar, but they don't have the cash in their pocket today. We'll lease it to them and we'll skim the profit off the top. So you can find opportunities like that throughout this market or any market. The intersection of those three is often the most powerful thing. And it takes someone, usually in business, to show leadership in starting that cycle going. And when they do, often they reap, as Elon has, multi-billion dollar opportunities. So for all the scary bits, I believe the future of energy is incredibly bright because of this disruption. Thank you very much.